Chapter Nine of the Old Adam. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amelia Chesley. The Old Adam, by Arnold Bennett, Chapter Nine, The First Night. One. It was upon an evening in June and a fine evening, full of the exquisite melancholy of summer in a city, that Edward Henry stood before a window, drumming thereon as he had once a less experienced man, with hair slightly less grey, drummed on the table of the mighty and arrogant Slosson. The window was the window of the managerial room of the Regent Theatre, and he could scarcely believe it, he could scarcely believe that he was not in a dream, for the room was papered, carpeted, and otherwise furnished. Only its electric light fittings were somewhat hasty and provisional, and the white ceiling showed a hole and a bunch of wires, like the nerves of a hollow tooth, whence one of Edward Henry's favorite chandeliers would ultimately depend. The whole of the theatre was at least as far advanced toward completion as that room. A great deal of it was more advanced. For instance, the auditorium, foyer, and bars— which were utterly finished, so far as anything ever is finished in a changing world. Wonders, marvels, and miracles had been accomplished. Mr. Alloyd, in the stress of the job, had even ceased to bring the Russian ballet into his conversations. Mr. Alloyd, despite a growing tendency to prove to Edward Henry by authentic anecdote about midnight his general proposition that woman as a sex treated him with shameful unfairness, had gained the high esteem of Edward Henry as an architect. He had fulfilled his word about those properties of the auditorium which had to do with hearing and seeing, insomuch that the auditorium was indeed unique in London. And he had taken care that the clerk of the works took care that the builder did not give up heart in the race with time. Moreover, he had maintained the peace with the terrible London County Council— all of whose inspecting departments seemed to have secretly decided that the Regent Theatre should be opened, not in June, as Edward Henry had decided, but at some vague future date toward the middle of the century. Months earlier, Edward Henry had ordained and announced that the Regent Theatre should be inaugurated on a given date in June, at the full height of splendor of the London season, and he had astounded the theatrical world by adhering through thick and thin to that date, and had thereby intensified his reputation as an eccentric. For the oldest inhabitant of that world could not recall a case in which the opening of a new theatre had not been promised for at least three widely different dates. Edward Henry had now arrived at the eve of the date, and if he had arrived there in comparative safety, with a reasonable prospect of avoiding complete shame and disaster, he felt, and he admitted, that the credit was due as much to Mr. Alloyd as to himself, which only confirmed an earlier impression of his that architects were queer people, rather like artists and poets in some ways, but with a basis of bricks and mortar to them. His own share in the enterprise of the regent had in theory been confined to engaging the right people for the right tasks and situations, and to signing checks. He had depended chiefly on Mr. Marrier, who, growing more radiant every day, had gradually developed into a sort of chubby Napoleon, taking an immense delight in detail and in choosing minor hands at round-sump salaries on the spur of the moment. Mr. Marrier refused no call upon his energy. He was helping Carlo Trent in the production and stage management of the play. He dried the tears of girlish neophytes at rehearsals. He helped to number the stalls. He showed a passionate interest in the tessellated pavement of the entrance. He taught the managerial typewriting girl how to make afternoon tea. He went to Hitchin to find a medieval chair required for the third act, and found it. In a word, he was fully equal to the post of acting manager. He managed. He managed everything and everybody except Edward Henry, and except the press agent, a functionary whose conviction of his own indispensability and importance— was so sincere that even Marrier shared it, and left him alone in his Bismarckian operations. The press agent, who sang in musical comedy chorus at night, knew that if the Regent Theatre succeeded, it would be his doing, and his alone. And yet Edward Henry, 
though he had delegated everything, had yet found a vast amount of work to do, and was thereby exhausted. That was why he was drumming on the pane. That was why he was conscious of a foolish desire to shove his fist through the pane. During the afternoon he had two scenes with two representatives of the libraries, so called because they deal in theatre tickets and not in books, who had declined to take up any of his tickets in advance. He had commenced an action against a firm of bill posters. He had settled an incipient strike in the limes department, originated by Mr. Cosmo Clark's views about lighting. He had dictated answers to seventy-nine letters of complaint from unknown people concerning the supply of free seats for the first night. He had responded in the negative to a request from a newspaper critic, who, on the score that he was deaf, wanted a copy of the play. He had replied finally to an official of the county council about the smoke trap over the stage. He had replied finally to another official of the county council about the electric sign. He had attended to a new curiosity on the part of another official of the county council about the Iron Curtain, and he had been almost rude to still another official of the county council about the wiring of the electric light in the dressing rooms. He had been unmistakably and pleasurably rude in writing to Slossons about their criticisms of the lock on the door of Lord Waldo's private entrance to the theatre. Also, he had arranged with the representative of the Chief Commissioner of Police concerning the carriage regulations for setting down and taking up. And he had indeed had more than enough. His nerves, though he did not know it, and would have scorned the imputation, were slowly giving way. Hence, really, the danger to the pain. Through the pain, in the dying light, he could see a cross-section of Shaftesbury Avenue and an aged newspaper lad leaning against a lamp-post and displaying a poster which spoke of Isabel Joy. Isabel Joy yet again! That little fact of itself contributed to his exasperation. He thought, considering the importance of the Regent Theatre and the salary he was paying to his press agent, that the newspapers ought to occupy their pages solely with the metropolitan affairs of Edward Henry Mackin. But the wretched Isabel had, as it were, got London by the throat, she had reached Chicago from the West, on her triumphant way home, and had there contrived to be arrested, according to Boast, but she was experiencing much more difficulty in emerging from the Chicago prison than in entering it, and the question was now becoming acute whether the emissary of the militant suffragettes would arrive back in London within the specified period of a hundred days. Naturally, London was holding its breath. London will keep calm during moderate crises— such as a national strike or the agony of the House of Lords, but when the supreme excitation is achieved, London knows how to let itself go. "'If you please, Mr. Mackin,' he turned. It was his typewriter, Miss Lindup, a young girl of some thirty-five years, holding a tea-tray. "'But I've had my tea once,' he snapped. "'But you've not had your dinner, sir, and it's half-past eight, she pleaded. He had known this girl for less than a month, and he paid her fewer shillings a week than the years of her age, and yet somehow she had assumed a worshipping charge of him, based on the idea that he was incapable of taking care of himself. To look at her appealing eyes, one might have thought that she would have died to ensure his welfare. "'And they want you to see about the linoleum for the gallery stairs,' she added timidly. "'The county councilman says it must be taken up the linoleum for the gallery stairs. Something snapped in him. He almost walked right through the young woman and the tea-tray. "'I'll linoleum them!' he bitterly exclaimed, and disappeared. 2. Having duly linoleumed them, or rather having very annoyingly quite failed to linoleum them, Edward Henry continued his way up the right-hand gallery staircase, and reached the auditorium, where, to his astonishment, a good deal of electricity at one penny three farthings a unit was blazing. Every seat in the narrow and high-pitched gallery, where at the sides the knees of one spectator would be on a level with the picture hat of the spectator in the row beneath, had a perfect and entire view of the proscenium opening, and Edward Henry now proved this unprecedented fact by climbing to the topmost corner seat, and therefrom surveying the scene of which he was monarch. The boxes were swathed in their new white dust-sheets, and likewise the higgledy-piggledy stalls, 
not as yet screwed down to the floor, save three or four stalls in the middle of the front row, from which the sheet had been removed. On one of these seats, far off though it was, he could descry a paper bag, probably containing sandwiches, and on another a pair of gloves and a walking stick. Several alert ladies with sketchbooks walked uneasily about in the aisles. The orchestra was hidden in the well provided for it, and apparently murmuring in its sleep. The magnificent drop-curtain, designed by Saracen Givington, A.R.A., concealed the stage. Suddenly Mr. Marrier and Carlo Trent appeared through the iron door that gave communication to initiates between the wings and the auditorium. They sat down in the stalls, and the curtain rose with a violent swish and disclosed the first set of The Orient Pearl. "'What about that amber, Cosmo?' Mr. Marrier cried thickly, after a pause, his mouth occupied with sandwich. "'There you are,' came the reply. "'Right,' said Mr. Marrier. "'Strike!' "'Don't strike,' contradicted Carlo Trent. "'Strike, I tell you. We must get on with the second act.' The voices resounded queerly in the empty theatre. The stage was invaded by scene-shifters before the curtain could descend again. Edward Henry heard the tripping step behind him. It was the faithful typewriting girl. "'I say,' he said, "'do you mind telling me what's going on here? It's true that in the rush of more important business I'd almost forgotten that a theatre is a place where they perform plays.' "'It's the dress rehearsal, Mr. Machin,' said the woman, startled and apologetic. "'But the dress rehearsal was fixed for three o'clock,' said he. "'It must have been finished three hours ago.' "'I think they've only just done the first act,' the woman breathed. "'I know they didn't begin till seven. "'Oh, Mr. Machin, of course it's no affair of mine, "'but I've worked in a good many theatres, "'and I do think it's such a mistake to have the dress rehearsal quite private. "'If you get a hundred or so people in the stalls, then it's an audience, "'and there's much less delay and everything goes much better. "'But when it's private dress rehearsal, it's just like any other rehearsal.' "'Only more so, perhaps,' said Edward Henry, smiling." He saw that he had made her happy, but he saw also that he had given her empire over him. "'I've got your tea here,' she said, rather like a hospital nurse now. "'Won't you drink it?' "'I'll drink it if it's not stewed,' he muttered. "'Oh,' she protested, "'of course it isn't. I poured it off the leaves into another teapot before I brought it up.' She went behind the barrier and reappeared, balancing a cup of tea with a slice of sultana cake edged on the saucer and as she handed it to him, the sustenance of rehearsals, she gazed at him, and he could almost hear her eyes saying, "'You poor thing!' There was nothing that he hated so much as to be pitied. "'You go home,' he commanded. "'Oh, but—' "'You go home. See,' he paused, threatening, "'if you don't clear out on the tick, I'll chuck this cup and saucer down into the stalls.' Horrified, she vanished. He sighed his relief. After some time the leader of the orchestra climbed into his chair, and the orchestra began to play, and the curtain went up again on the second act of the masterpiece in hexameters. The new scenery, which Edward Henry had with extraordinary courage insisted on Saracen Givington substituting for the original incomprehensibilities displayed at the Azure Society's performance, rather pleased him. Its colouring was agreeable, and it did resemble something definite. You could, though perhaps not easily, tell what it was meant to represent. The play proceeded, and the general effect was surprisingly pleasant to Edward Henry. And then Rose Euclid, as Heidi, came on for the great scene of the act. From the distance of the gallery she looked quite passably youthful, and beyond question she had a dominating presence in her resplendent costume. She was incomparably and amazingly better than she had been at the previous few rehearsals, which Edward Henry had been unfortunate enough to witness. She even reminded him of his earliest entrancing vision of her. "'Some people may like this,' he admitted, with a gleam of optimism. Hitherto, for weeks past, he had gone forward with his preparations in the most frigid and convinced pessimism. It seemed to him that he had become involved in a vast piece of machinery, and that nothing short of blowing the theatre up with dynamite would bring the cranks and pistons to a stop. And yet it seemed to him, also, that everything was unreal, that the contracts he signed were unreal, and the proofs he passed, and the posters he saw on the walls of London, 
and the advertisements in the newspapers. Only the checks he drew had the air of being real, and now, in a magic flash, after a few moments gazing at the stage, he saw all differently. He scented triumph from afar off, as one sniffs the tang of the sea. On the morrow he had to meet Nellie at Euston, and he had shrunk from meeting her, with her terrible, remorseless, provincial, untheatrical common sense. But now, in another magic flash, he envisaged the meeting with a cockadoodle doo of hope. Strange! He admitted it was strange. And then he failed to hear several words spoken by Rose Euclid, and then a few more. As the emotion of the scene grew, the proportion of her words audible in the gallery diminished, until she became, for him, totally inarticulate, raving away there and struggling in a cocoon of hexameters. Despair seized him. His nervous system, every separate nerve of it, was on the rack once more. He stood up in a sort of paroxysm, and called loudly across the vast intervening space, "'Speak more distinctly, please!' A fearful silence fell upon the whole theatre. The rehearsal stopped. The building itself seemed to be staggered. Somebody had actually demanded that words should be uttered articulately. Mr. Marrier turned toward the intruder, as one determined to put an end to such singularities. "'Who's up there?' "'I am,' said Edward Henry. "'and I want it to be clearly understood in my theatre "'that the first thing an actor has to do "'is to make himself heard. "'I dare say I'm devilish odd, "'but that's how I look at it.' "'Whom do you mean, Mr. Mockin?' "'asked Marrier in a different tone. "'I mean Miss Euclid, of course. "'Here I've spent heaven knows how much "'on the acoustics of this theatre, "'and I can't make out a word she says. "'I can hear all the others, "'and this is the dress rehearsal.' "'You must remember you're in the gallery,' said Mr. Marrier firmly. "'And what if I am? I'm not giving gallery seats away to-morrow night. "'It's true I'm giving half the stalls away, but the gallery will be paid for.' "'Another silence,' said Rose Euclid sharply, "'and Edward Henry caught every word with the most perfect distinctness. "'I'm sick and tired of people saying they can't make out what I say. "'They actually write me letters about it.' Why should people make out what I say? She quitted the stage. Another silence. Ring down the curtain, said Mr. Marrier, in a thrilled voice. 3. Shortly afterward, Mr. Marrier came into the managerial office, lit up now, where Edward Henry was dictating to his typewriter and hospital nurse who, having been caught in hat and jacket on the threshold, had been brought back and was tapping his words direct on to the machine. It was a remarkable fact that the sole proprietor of the Regent Theatre was now in high spirits and good humour. "'Well, Marrier, my boy,' he saluted the acting manager, "'how are you getting on with that rehearsal?' "'Well, sir,' said Mr. Marrier, "'I'm not getting on with it. Miss Euclid refuses absolutely to proceed.' She's in her dressing-room. "'But why?' inquired Edward Henry, with bland surprise. "'Doesn't she want to be heard by her gallery boys?' Mr. Marrier showed a feeble smile. "'She hasn't been spoken to like that for thirty years,' said he. "'But don't you agree with me?' asked Edward Henry. "'Yes,' said Marrier. "'I agree with you. "'And doesn't your friend Carlo want his precious hexameters to be heard?' "'We both agree with you,' said Marrier. "'The fact is, we've done all we could, but it's no use. "'She's splendid, only—' "'He paused. "'Only you can't make out ten per cent of what she says,' "'Edward Henry finished for him. "'Well, I've got no use for that in my theatre. "'He found a singular pleasure in emphasizing the phrase, "'My theatre. "'That's all very well,' said Marrier. "'But what are you going to do about it? "'I've tried everything.' "'You've come in and burst up the entire show, if you'll forgive my saying so.' "'Do?' exclaimed Edward Henry. "'It's perfectly simple. All you have to do is act. "'God bless my soul, aren't you getting fifteen pounds a week, and aren't you my acting manager? "'Act, then. You've done enough hinting. You've proved that hints are no good. "'You'd have known that from your birth up, Marrier, if you'd been born in the five towns. "'Act, my boy.' 
But how? If she won't go on, she won't. Is her understudy in the theatre? Yes, it's Miss Cunningham, you know. What salary does she get? Ten pounds a week? What for? Well, partly to understudy, I suppose. Let her earn it, then. Go on with the rehearsal, and let her play the part tomorrow night. She'll be delighted, you bet. But— Miss Lindop, Edward Henry interrupted, will you please read to Mr. Marrier what I've dictated? He turned to Marrier. It's an interview with myself for one of tomorrow's papers. Miss Lindop, with tears in her voice, if not in her eyes, obeyed the order, and drawing the paper from the machine, read its contents aloud. Mr. Marrier started back, not in the figurative, but the literal sense, as he listened. "'But you'll never send that out!' he exclaimed. "'Why not? No paper will print it!' "'My dear Marrier,' said Edward Henry, "'don't be a simpleton. You know as well as I do that half a dozen papers will be delighted to print it, and all the rest will copy the one that does print it. It'll be the talk of London to-morrow, and Isabel Joy will be absolutely snuffed out.' "'Well,' said Mr. Marrier, "'I never heard of such a thing.' pity you didn't, then. Mr. Marrier moved away. I say, he murmured at the door, don't you think you ought to read that to Rose first? I'll read it to Rose like a bird, said Edward Henry. Within two minutes it was impossible to get from his room to the dressing-room in less. He was knocking at Rose Euclid's door. Who's there? said a voice. He entered, and then replied, I am. Rose Euclid was smoking a cigarette and scratching the arm of an easy-chair behind her. Her maid stood nearby with a whiskey and soda. "'Sorry you can't go on with the rehearsal, Miss Euclid,' said Edward Henry very quickly. "'However, we must do the best we can. But Mr. Marrier thought you'd like to hear this. It's part of an interview with me that's going to appear tomorrow in the press.' Without pausing, he went on to read— I found Mr. Alderman Machin, the hero of the five towns, and the proprietor and initiator of London's newest and most up-to-date and most intellectual theatre, surrounded by a complicated apparatus of telephones and typewriters, in his managerial room at the Regent. He received me very courteously. Yes, he said, in response to my question, the rumour is quite true. The principal part in The Orient Pearl will be played on the first night by Miss Euclid's understudy, Miss Olga Cunningham, a young woman of very remarkable talent. No, Miss Euclid is not ill, or even indisposed, but she and I have had a grave difference of opinion. The point between us was whether Miss Euclid's speeches ought to be clearly audible in the auditorium. I considered they ought. I may be wrong, I may be provincial, but that was and is my view. At the dress rehearsal, seated in the gallery, I could not hear her lines. I objected. She refused to consider the subject or to proceed with the rehearsal. Hinc ele lacrime. Not at all, said Mr. Machin, in reply to a question. I have the highest admiration for Miss Euclid's genius. I should not presume to dictate to her as to her art. She has had a very long experience of the stage, very long, and doubtless knows better than I do. Only the regent happens to be my theatre, and I am responsible for it. Every member of the audience will have a complete, uninterrupted view of the stage, and I intend that every member of the audience shall hear every word that is uttered on the stage. I'm odd, I know, but then I've a reputation for oddness to keep up. And by the way, I'm sure that Miss Cunningham will make a great reputation for herself. "'Not while I'm here, she won't!' exclaimed Rose Euclid, standing up and enunciating her words with marvellous clearness. Edward Henry glanced at her, and then continued to read. Suggestions for headlines, piquant quarrel between manager and star actress. Unparalleled situation. Trouble at the Regent Theatre. "'Mr. Machin,' said Rose Euclid, "'you are not a gentleman.' "'You'd hardly think so, would you?' mused Edward Henry, as if mildly interested in this new discovery of Miss Euclid's. "'Maria,' said the star to her maid, "'go and tell Mr. Marrier I'm coming.' "'And I'll go back to the gallery,' said Edward Henry. "'It's the place for people like me, isn't it? "'I dare say I'll tear up this paper later, Miss Euclid. "'We'll see.' Four. On the next night a male figure in evening dress and a pale overcoat might have been seen standing at the corner of Piccadilly Circus and Lower Regent Street, 
staring at an electric sign in the shape of a shield, which said in its glittering, throbbing speech of incandescence, The Regent, Rose Euclid, in The Orient Pearl. The figure crossed the circus and stared at the sign from a new point of view. Then it passed along Coventry Street and stared at the sign from yet another point of view. Then it reached Shaftesbury Avenue and stared again. Then it returned to its original station. It was the figure of Edward Henry Mackin, savoring the glorious electric sign of which he had dreamed. He lit a cigarette and thought of Seven Sachs gazing at the name of Seven Sachs in fire on the façade of a Broadway theatre in New York. Was not this London phenomenon at least as fine? He considered it was. The Regent Theatre existed. There it stood. What a name for a theatre! Its windows were all illuminated. Its entrance lamps bathed the pavement in light, and in this radiance stood the commissionaires in their military pride and their new uniforms. A line of waiting automobiles began a couple of yards to the north of the main doors, and continued round all sorts of dark corners and up all manner of back streets towards Golden Square itself. Marrier had had the automobiles counted, and had told him the number, but such was Edward Henry's condition that he had forgotten. A row of boards reared on the pavement against the walls of the façade said, "'Stalls full, private boxes full, dress circle full, upper circle full, pit full, gallery full.' and attached to the ironwork of the glazed entrance canopy was a long board which gave the same information in terser form. House full. The regent had indeed been obliged to refuse quite a lot of money on its opening night. After all, the inauguration of a new theatre was something, even in London. Important personages had actually begged the privilege of buying seats at normal prices, and had been refused. Unimportant personages, such as those who boast in the universe that they had never missed a first night in the West End for twenty, thirty, or even fifty years, had tried to buy seats at abnormal prices, and had failed, which was in itself a tragedy. Edward Henry, at the final moment, had yielded his wife's stall to the insistence of a minister of the Crown, and at Lady Waldo's urgent request had put her into Lady Waldo's private landowner's box— where also was Miss Elsie April, who had already had the pleasure of meeting Mrs. Mockin. Edward Henry's first night was an event of magnitude, and he alone was responsible for it. His volition alone had brought into being that grand edifice, whose light yellow walls now gleamed in nocturnal mystery under the shimmer of countless electric bulbs. "'There goes pretty nigh forty thousand pounds of my money,' he reflected, excitedly. And, he reflected, after all, I'm somebody. Then he glanced down Lower Regent Street, and saw Sir John Pilgrim's much larger theatre, now sublet to a tenant who also was lavish with displays of radiance. And he reflected that on first nights Sir John Pilgrim, in addition to doing all that he himself had done, would hold the great role on the stage throughout the evening, and he admired the astounding, dazzling energy of such a being, and admitted ungrudgingly— He's somebody, too. I wonder what part of the world he's illuminating just now. Edward Henry did not deny to his soul that he was extremely nervous. He would not and could not face even the bare possibility that the first play presented at the new theatre might be a failure. He had meant to witness the production incognito among the crowd in the pit or in the gallery, but after visiting the pit a few moments before the curtain went up, he had been appalled by the hard-hearted levity of the pit's remarks on things in general. The pit did not seem to be in any way chastened or softened by the fact that a fortune, that reputations, that careers were at stake. He had fled from the packed pit. As for the gallery, he decided that he had already had enough of the gallery. He had wandered about corridors and to and fro in his own room and in the wings, and even in the basement, as nervous as a lost cat, or an author, and as self-conscious as a criminal who knows himself to be on the edge of discovery. It was a fact that he could not look people in the eyes. The reception of the first act had been fairly amiable, and he had suffered horribly as he listened for the applause. Catching sight of Carlo Trent in the distance of a passage, he had positively run away from Carlo Trent. 
The first interact had seemed to last for about three months. Its nightmarish length had driven him almost to lunacy. The feel of the second act, so far as it mystically communicated itself to him in his place of concealment, had been better. At the end of the second fall of the curtain, the applause had been enthusiastic. Yes, enthusiastic. Curiously, it was the revulsion caused by this new birth of hope that, while the third act was being played, had driven him out of the theatre. His wild hope needed ozone. His breast had to expand in the boundless prairie of Piccadilly Circus. His legs had to walk. His arms had to swing. Now he crossed the circus again to his own pavement, and gazed like a stranger at his own posters. On several of them, encircled in a scarlet ring, was the sole name of Rose Euclid. Impressive! And smaller, but above it, the legend E. H. Machin, sole proprietor. He asked himself impartially, as his eyes uneasily left the poster and slipped around the circus, deserted save by a few sinister and idle figures at that hour, should I have sent that interview to the papers, or shouldn't I? I wonder. I expect some folks would say on the whole I've been rather hard on Rose since I first met her. Anyhow, she's speaking up all right tonight. He laughed shortly. A newsboy floated up from the circus bearing a poster with the name of Isabel Joy on it in large letters. He thought, Be blowed to Isabel Joy. He did not care a fig for Isabel Joy's competition now. And then a small door opened in the wall close by, and an elegant cloaked woman came out onto the pavement. The door was the private door, leading to the private box of Lord Waldo, owner of the ground upon which the Regent Theatre was built. The woman he recognized with confusion as Elsie April, whom he had not seen alone since the Azure Society's night. "'What are you doing out here, Mr. Machin?' she greeted him with pleasant composure. "'I'm thinking,' said he. "'It's going splendidly,' she remarked. "'Really? I'm just running round to the stage door to meet dear Rose as she comes off. What a delightful woman your wife is! So pretty and so sensible!' She disappeared round the corner before he could compose a suitable husband's reply to this laudation of a wife. Then the commissionaires at the entrance seemed to start into life, and then suddenly several preoccupied men strode rapidly out of the theatre, buttoning their coats, and vanished phantom-like, critics on their way to destruction. The performance must be finishing. Hastily he followed in the direction taken by Elsie April. He was in the wings on the prompt side. Close by stood the prompter, an untidy youth with imperfections of teeth, clutching hard at the red-scored manuscript of the Orient Pearl. Sundry players of varying stellar degrees were posed around the opulent costumes designed by Saracen Givington, A.R.A. Miss Lindop was in the background, ecstatically happy, her cheeks a race-course of tears. Afar off, in the centre of the stage, alone, stood Rose Euclid, gorgeous in green and silver, bowing and bowing and bowing, bowing before the storm of approval and acclamation that swept from the auditorium across the footlights. With a sound like that of tearing silk, or of a gigantic contralto mosquito, the curtain swished down, and swished up, and swished down again. Bouquets flew onto the stage from the auditorium, a custom newly imported from the United States by Miss Euclid, and encouraged by her, though contrary to the lofty canons of London taste. The actress already held one huge trophy, shaped as a crown, to her breast. She hesitated, and then ran to the wings and caught Edward Henry by the wrist impulsively, madly. They shook hands in an ecstasy. It was as though they recognized in one another a fundamental and glorious worth. It was as though no words could ever express the depth of appreciation, affection, and admiration which each intensely felt for the other. It was as though this moment were the final consecration of twin lives, whose long, loyal comradeship had never been clouded by the faintest breath of mutual suspicion. Rose Euclid was still the unparalleled star, the image of grace and beauty and dominance upon the stage, and yet quite clearly Edward Henry saw close to his the wrinkled, damaged, daubed face and thin neck of an old woman, and it made no difference. 
Rose! cried a strained voice, and Rose Euclid wrenched herself from him and tumbled with half a sob into the clasping arms of Elsie April. You've saved the intellectual theatre for London, my boy. That's what you've done. Marrier was now gripping his hand, and Edward Henry was convinced that he had. The strident vigour of the applause showed no diminution, and through the thick heavy rain of it could be heard the monotonous insistent detonations of one syllable. Thor! 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 And then another syllable was added. Speech! 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 Mechanically, Edward Henry lit a cigarette. He had no consciousness of doing so. Where is Trent? people were asking. Carlo Trent appeared up a staircase at the back of the stage. You've got to go on, said Marrier. Now pull yourself together. The great beast is calling for you. Say a few words. Carlo Trent, in his turn, seized the hand of Edward Henry, and it was for all the world as though he were seizing the hand of an intellectual and poetic equal, and wrung it. "'Come now, Mr. Marrier, beaming,' admonished him, and then pushed. "'What must I say?' stammered Carlo. "'Whatever comes into your head.' "'All right, I'll say something.' A man in a dirty white apron drew back the heavy mass of the curtain about eighteen inches, and, Carlo Trent stepping forward, the glare of the footlights suddenly lit his white face. The applause, now multiplied fivefold and becoming deafening, seemed to beat him back against the curtain. His lips worked. He did not bow. "'Come back, you fool!' whispered Marrier, and Carlo Trent stepped back into safe shelter. "'Why didn't you say something?' "'I c c couldn't murmured the greatest dramatic poet in the world, and began to cry. "'Speech! Speech! Speech! Speech!' "'Here,' said Edward Henry, gruffly, "'get out of my way. I'll settle him. Get out of my way.' And he riddled Carlo Trent with a fusillade of savagely scornful glances. The man in the apron obediently drew back the curtain again, and the next second Edward Henry was facing an auditorium crowded with his patrons. Everybody was standing up, chiefly in the aisles and crowded at the entrances, and quite half the people were waving, and quite a quarter of them were shouting. He bowed several times. An age elapsed. His ears were stunned, but it seemed to him that his brain was working with marvellous perfection. He perceived that he had been utterly wrong about the Orient Pearl, and that all his advisers had been splendidly right. He had failed to catch its charm and to feel its power— but this audience, this magnificent representative audience drawn from London in the brilliant height of the season, had not failed. It occurred to him to raise his hand, and as he raised his hand it occurred to him that his hand held a lighted cigarette. A magic hush fell upon the magnificent audience, which owned all that endless line of automobiles outside. Edward Henry, in the hush, took a pull at his cigarette. "'Ladies and gentlemen,' he said, pitching his voice well, for municipal politics had made him a practised public speaker, "'I congratulate you. This evening you have succeeded.' There was a roar, confused, mirthful, humorously protesting. He distinctly heard a man in the front row of the stalls say, "'Well, for sheer nerve,' and then go off into a peal of laughter. He smiled and retired. Marrier took charge of him. "'You merit the entire confectioner's shop!' exclaimed Marrier, aghast, admiring, triumphant. Now Edward Henry had no intention of meriting cake. He had merely followed in speech the secret train of his thought. But he saw that he had treated a West End audience as a West End audience had never before been treated, and that his audacity had conquered— Hence he determined not to refuse the cake. "'Didn't I tell you I'd settle him?' said he. The band played God Save the King. 6. One hour later, in the double-bedded chamber at the Majestic, as his wife lay in bed and he was methodically folding up a creased white tie and inspecting his chin in the mirror, he felt that he was touching again, after an immeasurable interval, the rock-bottom of reality.' 
Nelly, even when he could see only her face, and that in a mirror, was the most real phenomenon in his existence, and she possessed the strange faculty of dispelling all unreality round about her. "'Well,' he said, "'how did you get on in the box?' "'Oh,' she replied, "'I got on very well with the Waldo woman. She's one of our sort. But I'm not so set up with your Elsie April.' "'Dash this collar!' Nellie continued. "'And I can tell you another thing. I don't envy Mr. Rollo Rissell. "'What's Rissell got to do with it?' "'She means to marry him.' "'Elsie April means to marry Rissell? "'He was in and out of the box all night. It was plain as a pikestaff. "'What's amiss with my Elsie April?' Edward Henry demanded. "'She's a thought too pleasant for my taste,' answered Nellie. Astonishing how pleasantness is regarded with suspicion in the five towns, even by women who can at a pinch be angels. 7. Often during the brief night he gazed sleepily at the vague next bed, and mused upon the extraordinariness of women's consciences. His wife slept like an innocent. She always did. It was as though she gently expired every evening, and returned gloriously to life every morning. The sunshiny hours between three and seven were very long to him, but it was indisputable that he did not hear the clock strike six, which was at any rate proof of a little sleep to the good. At five minutes past seven he thought he heard a faint rustling noise in the corridor, and he arose and tiptoed to the door and opened it. Yes, the Majestic had its good qualities. He had ordered that all the London morning daily papers should be laid at his door as early as possible, and there the pile was, somewhat damp, and as fresh as fruit, with a slight odour of ink. He took it in. His heart was beating as he climbed back into bed with it, and arranged pillows so that he could sit up, and unfolded the first paper. Nellie had not stirred. Once again he was disappointed in the prominence given by the powerful London press to his London enterprise. In the first newspaper, a very important one, he positively could not find any criticism of the regent's first night. There was nearly a page of the offensive Isabel Joy, who was now appealing through the newspapers to the President of the United States. Isabel had been christened the World Circler, and the special correspondents of the entire earth were gathered about her carpeted cell. Hope still remained that she would reach London within the hundred days. An unknown adherent of the cause for which she suffered had promised to give ten thousand pounds to that cause if she did so. Furthermore, she was receiving over sixty proposals of marriage a day, and so on and so on. Most of this he gathered in an instant from the headlines alone, nauseating. Another annoying item in the paper was a column and a half given to the foundation stone laying of the first New Thought Church in Dean Street, Soho about a couple of hundred yards from its original site. He hated the first New Thought Church, as one always hates that to which one has done an injury. Then he found what he was searching for. Regent Theatre, production of poetical drama at London's latest playhouse. After all, it was well situated in the paper, on quite an important page, and there was over a column of it. But in his nervous excitation his eyes had missed it. His eyes now read it. Over half of it was given to a discussion of the Don Juan legend and the significance of the Byronic character of Heidi, obviously written before the performance. A description of the plot occupied most of the rest, and a reference to the acting ended it. Miss Rose Euclid, in the trying and occasionally beautiful part of Heidi, was all that her admirers could have wished. Miss Cunningham distinguished herself by her diction and her bearing in the small part of the messenger. The final words were, The reception was quite favourable. Quite favourable, indeed, Edward Henry had a chill. Good heavens, was not the reception ecstatically, madly, foolishly enthusiastic? Why, he exclaimed within, I never saw such a reception. It was true, but then he had never seen any other first night. He was shocked, as well as chilled. And for this reason, for weeks past, all the newspapers, in their dramatic gossip, had contained highly sympathetic references to his enterprise. 
according to the paragraphs he was a wondrous man and the theatre was a wondrous house the best of all possible theatres and carlo trent was a great writer and rose euclid exactly as marvellous as she had been a quarter of a century before and the prospects of the intellectual poetic drama in london so favourable as to amount to a certainty of success in those columns of dramatic gossip there was no flaw in the theatrical world in those columns of dramatic gossip no piece ever failed though sometimes a piece was withdrawn regretfully and against the wishes of the public to make room for another piece in those columns of dramatic gossip theatrical managers actors and especially actresses and even authors were benefactors of society and therefore they were treated with the deference the gentleness the heartfelt sympathy which benefactors of society merit and ought to receive the tone of criticism of the first night was different it was subtly not crudely different but different it was the next newspaper said the play was bad and the audience indulgent it was very severe on carlo trent and very kind to the players whom it regarded as good men and women in adversity with particular laudations for miss rose euclid and the messenger the next newspaper said the play was a masterpiece and would be so hailed in any country but england england however unfortunately this was a newspaper whose political opinions edward henry despised the next newspaper praised everything and everybody and called the reception tumultuously enthusiastic and edward henry felt as though somebody mistaking his face for a slice of toast had spread butter all over it even the paper's parting assurance that the future of the higher drama in london was now safe beyond question did not remove this delusion of butter the two following newspapers were more sketchy or descriptive and referred at some length to edward henry's own speech with a kind of sub-hint that edward henry had better mind what he was about three illustrated papers had photographs of scenes and figures but nothing important in the matter of criticism the rest was neither one thing nor the other as they say in the five towns on the whole an inscrutable press a disconcerting a startling an appetite destroying but not a hopeless press the general impression which he gathered from his perusals was that the author was a pretentious dullard an absolute criminal a genius that the actors and actresses were all splendid and worked hard though conceivably one or two of them had been set impossible tasks to wit tasks unsuited to their personalities that he himself was a napoleon a temerarious individual an incomprehensible fellow and that the future of the intellectual poetic drama in london was not a topic of burning actuality he remembered sadly the superlative laden descriptions in those same newspapers of that theatre itself a week or two back the unique theatre in which the occupant of every seat had a complete and uninterrupted view of the whole of the proscenium opening surely that fact alone ought to have ensured proper treatment for him then nelly woke up and saw the scattered newspapers well she asked what do they say oh he replied lightly with a laugh just about what you'd expect of course you know what a first night audience always is too generous and ours was particularly miss april saw to that she had the azure society behind her and she was determined to help rose euclid however i should say it was all right i should say it was quite all right i told you it was a gamble you know when nelly dressing said that she considered she ought to go back home that day he offered no objection indeed he rather wanted her to go not that he had a desire to spend the whole of his time at the theatre unhampered by provincial women in london on the contrary he was aware of a most definite desire not to go to the theatre he lay in bed and watched with careless curiosity the rapid processes of Nellie's toilet. He had his breakfast on the dressing-table, for he was not at Wilkins's, neither at the Grand Babylon. Then he helped her to pack, and finally he accompanied her to Euston, where she kissed him with affectionate common sense, and caught the twelve-five. He was relieved that nobody from five towns happened to be going down by that train. As he turned away from the moving carriage, the evening papers had just arrived at the bookstalls. He bought the four chief organs, one green, one yellowish, 
one white, one pink, and scanned them self-consciously on the platform. The white organ had a good heading. Rebirth of the intellectual drama in London. What a provincial has done. Opinions of the leading men. Two columns altogether. There was, however, little in the two columns. The leading men had practiced a sagacious caution. They, like the press as a whole, were obviously waiting to see which way the great elephantine public would jump. When the enormous animal had jumped, they would all exclaim, "'What did I tell you?' The other critiques were colorless. At the end of the green critique occurred the following sentence. It is only fair to state, nevertheless, that the play was favorably received by an apparently enthusiastic audience. Nevertheless, apparently, Edward Henry turned the page to the theatrical advertisements. Unreal, fantastic, was this he, Edward Henry? Could it be still his mother's son? Still, matinees every Wednesday and Saturday. Every Wednesday and Saturday. That word implied and necessitated a long run, anyhow a run extending over months. That word comforted him. Though he knew as well as you do that Mr. Marrier had composed the advertisement, and that he himself was paying for it, it comforted him. He was just like a child. 8. I say, Cunningham's made a hit! Mr. Marrier almost shouted at him as he entered the managerial room at the Regent. "'Cunningham? Who's Cunningham?' Then he remembered. She was the girl who played the messenger. She had only three words to say, and to say them over and over again, and she had made a hit. "'Seen the notices?' asked Marrier. "'Yes. What of them?' "'Oh, well,' Marrier drawled, "'what would you expect?' "'That's just what I said,' observed Edward Henry. "'You did, did you?' Mr. Marrier exclaimed, as if extremely interested by this corroboration of his views. Carlo Trent strolled in. He remarked that he happened to be just passing, but the discussion of the situation was not carried very far. That evening the house was nearly full, except the pit and the gallery, which were nearly empty. Applause was perfunctory. "'How much?' Edward Henry inquired of the box-office manager when figures were added together. Thirty-one pounds, two shillings. Hm. "'Of course,' said Mr. Marrier, "'in the height of the London season, with so many counter-attractions. "'Besides, they've got to get used to the idea of it.' Edward Henry did not turn pale. Still, he was aware that it cost him a trifle over sixty pounds to ring the curtain up at every performance— and this sum took no account of the expenses of production, nor of author's fees. The sum would have been higher, but he was calculating as rent of the theatre only the ground rent plus six per cent on the total price of the building. What disgusted him was the duplicity of the first-night audience, and he said to himself violently, I was right all the time, and I knew I was right. Idiots! Chumps! Of course I was right! On the third night the house held twenty-seven pounds and sixpence. "'Naturally,' said Mr. Marrier, "'in this hot weather. I never knew such a hot June. It's the open-air places that are doing us in the eye. In fact, I heard to-day that the White City is packed. They simply can't bank their money quick enough.' It was on that day that Edward Henry paid salaries. It appeared to him that he was providing half London with a livelihood— acting managers, stage managers, assistant ditto, property men, stage hands, electricians, prompters, call boys, box office staff, general staff, dressers, commissionaires, program girls, cleaners, actors, actresses, understudies, to say nothing of Rose Euclid at a purely nominal salary of one hundred pounds a week. The tenants of the bars were grumbling, but happily he was getting money from them. The following day was Saturday. It rained, a succession of thunderstorms. The morning and the evening performances produced together sixty-eight pounds. "'Well,' said Mr. Marrier, "'in this kind of weather you can't expect people to come out, can you? Besides this cursed week-ending habit.' Which conclusions did not materially modify the harsh fact that Edward Henry was losing over thirty pounds a day, or at the rate of over ten thousand pounds a year.' 
He spent Sunday between his hotel and his club, chiefly in reiterating to himself that Monday began a new week, and that something would have to occur on Monday. Something did occur. Carlo Trent lounged into the office early. The man was forever being drawn to the theatre as by an invisible but powerful elastic cord. The papers had a worse attack than ever of Isabel Joy, for she had been convicted of transgression in a Chicago court of law, but a tremendous lawyer from St. Louis had loomed over Chicago, and having examined the documents in the case, was hopeful of getting the conviction quashed. He had discovered that in one and the same document, Isabel had been spelt Isobel, and worse, Illinois had been deprived by a careless clerk of one of its L's. He was sure that by proving these grave irregularities in American justice, he could win on appeal. Edward Henry glanced up suddenly from the newspaper. He had been inspired. "'I say, Trent,' he remarked, without any warning or preparation, "'you're not looking at all well. I want a change myself. I've a good mind to take you for a sea voyage.' "'Oh,' grumbled Trent, "'I can't afford sea voyages.' "'I can,' said Edward Henry, "'and I shouldn't dream of letting it cost you a penny. "'I'm not a philanthropist, "'but I know as well as anybody "'that it will pay us theatrical managers "'to keep you in health. "'You're not going to take the play off?' "'Trent demanded suspiciously. "'Certainly not,' said Edward Henry. "'What sort of a sea voyage?' "'Well, what price the Atlantic? "'Been to New York? "'Neither have I.' "'Let's go, just for the trip. It'll do us good.' "'You don't mean it,' murmured the greatest dramatic poet, who had never voyaged farther than the Isle of Wight. His eyeglass swung to and fro. Edward Henry feigned to resent this remark. "'Of course I mean it. Do you take me for a blooming gas-bag?' He rose. "Marrier," then more loudly. "Marrier," Mr. Marrier entered. "'Do you know anything about the sailings to New York?' "'Rather,' said Mr. Marrier, beaming. After all, he was a most precious aid. "'We may be able to arrange for a production in New York,' said Edward Henry to Carlo, mysteriously. Mr. Marrier gazed at one and then at the other, puzzled. End of chapter 9「Chapter Ten of the Old Adam. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. The Old Adam by Arnold Bennett. Isabel. One. Throughout the voyage of the Lithuania from Liverpool to New York, Edward Henry, in common with some two thousand other people on board, had the sensation of being hurried. He who in a cab rides late to an important appointment arrives with muscles fatigued by mentally aiding the horse to move the vehicle along. Thus were Edward Henry's muscles fatigued, and the muscles of many others, but just as much more so as the Lithuania was bigger than a cab for the lithuania having been seriously delayed in liverpool by men who were most ridiculously striking for the fantastic remuneration of one pound a week was engaged on the business of making new records and every passenger was personally determined that she should therein succeed and despite very bad june weather toward the end she did sail past the battery on a grand monday morning with a new record to her credit so far edward henry's plan was not miscarrying but he had a very great deal to do and very little time in which to do it and whereas the muscles of the other passengers were relaxed as the ship drew to her berth edward henry's muscles were only more tensely tightened he had expected to see mr seven sachs on the quay for in response to his telegram from queenstown the illustrious actor author had sent him an agreeable wireless message in full atlantic the which had inspired edward henry to obtain news by marconi both from london and new york at much expense from the east he had had daily information of the dwindling receipts 
at the regent theatre and from the west daily information concerning isabel joy he had not however expected mr seven sachs to walk into the lithuania's music saloon an hour before the ship touched the quay nevertheless this was what mr seven sachs did by the exercise of those mysterious powers wielded by the influential in democratic communities and what are you doing here mr seven sachs greeted edward henry with geniality edward henry lowered his voice i'm throwing good money after bad said he the friendly grip of mr seven sachs's hand did him good reassured him and gave him courage he was utterly tired of the voyage and also of the poetical society of carlo trent whose passage had cost him thirty pounds considerable boredom and some sick nursing during the final days and nights a dramatic poet with an appetite was a full dose for edward henry but a dramatic poet who lay on his back and moaned for naught but soda-water and dry land amounted to more than edward henry could conveniently swallow he directed mr sachs's attention to the anguished and debile organism which had once been carlo trent and mr sachs was so sympathetic that carlo trent began to adore him and edward henry to be somewhat disturbed in his previous estimate of mr sachs's common sense but at a favourable moment mr sachs breathed humorously into edward henry's ear the question what have you brought him out for i've brought him out to lose him as they pushed through the bustle of the enormous ship and descended from the dizzy eminence of her boat deck by lifts and ladders down to the level of the windy sun-steeped rock of new york edward henry said now i want you to understand mr sachs that i haven't a minute to spare i've just looked in for lunch going on to chicago she isn't in chicago is she demanded edward henry aghast i thought she'd reached new york who isabel joy oh isabel's in new york sure enough she's right here they say she'll have to catch the lithuania if she's going to get away with it get away with what well the goods the precious words reminded edward henry of an evening at wilkins and raised his spirits even higher it was a word he loved and i've got to catch the lithuania too said he but trent doesn't know and let me tell you she's going to do the quickest turn round that any ship ever did the purser assured me she'll leave at noon to-morrow unless the world comes to an end in the meantime now what about a hotel you'll stay with me naturally but edward henry protested oh yes you will i shall be delighted but i must look after trent you'll stay with me too naturally i live at the stuyvesant hotel you know on fifth i've a pretty good private suite there i shall arrange a little supper for to-night my automobile is here is it possible that i once saved your life and have forgotten all about it edward henry exclaimed or do you treat everybody like this we like to look after our friends said mr sachs simply in the terrific confusion of the quay where groups of passengers were mounted like watchdogs over hillocks of baggage mr sachs stood continually between the travellers and the administrative rigours and official incredulity of a proud republic and in the minimum of time the fine trunk of edward henry and the modest packages of the poet were on the roof of mr sachs vast car the three men were inside and the car was leaping somewhat in the manner of a motor-boat at full speed over the cobbles of a wide medieval street quick thought edward henry i haven't a minute to lose his prayer reached the chauffeur conversation was difficult carlo trent groaned presently they rolled less perilously upon asphalt though the equipage still lurched edward henry was forever bending his head toward the window aperture in order to glimpse the roofs of the buildings and never seeing the roofs now we're on fifth said mr sachs after a fearful lurch with pride vistas of flags high cornices crowded pavements marble jewelry behind glass the whole scene through a roaring phantasmagoria of competing and menacing vehicles and edward henry thought this is my sort of place the jolting recommenced carlo trent rebounded limply groaning between cushions and upholstery edward henry tried to pretend that he was not frightened then there was a shock as of the concussion of two equally unyielding natures a pane of glass in mr seven sachs's limousine flew to fragments and the car stopped i expect that's a spring gone observed mr sachs with tranquillity 
well happen you know sometimes everybody got out mr sachs's presumption was correct one of the back wheels had failed to leap over a hole in fifth avenue some eighteen inches deep and two feet long what is that hole asked edward henry well said mr sachs it's just a hole we'd better transfer to a taxi he gave calm orders to his chauffeur four empty taxes passed down the sunny magnificence of fifth avenue and ignored mr sachs's urgent waving the fifth stopped the baggage was strapped and tied to it which process occupied much time edward henry fuming against delay gazed around a nonchalant policeman on a superb horse occupied the middle of the road tramcars passed constantly across the street in front of his caracoling horse dividing a route for themselves in the wild ocean of traffic as moses cut into the red sea at intervals a knot of persons intimidated and yet daring would essay the voyage from one pavement to the opposite pavement there was no half-way refuge for these adventurers as in decrepit london some apparently arrived others seemed to disappear forever in the feverish welter of confused motion and were never heard of again the policeman easily accommodating himself to the caracolings of his mount gazed absently at edward henry and edward henry gazed first at the policeman and then at the high decorated grandeur of the buildings and then at the azurian taxi into which mr sachs was now ingeniously inserting carlo trent he thought no mistake this street is alive but what cemeteries they must have he followed carlo with minute precautions into the interior of the taxi and then came the supremely delicate operation that of introducing a third person into the same vehicle it was accomplished three chins and six knees fraternized in close intimacy but the door would not shut wheezing snorting shaking complaining the taxi drew slowly away from mr sachs's luxurious automobile and left it forlorn to its chauffeur mr sachs imperturbably smiled i have two other automobiles said mr sachs in some sixty seconds the taxi stopped in front of the tremendous glass awning of the stuyvesant the baggage was unstrapped the passengers were extracted one by one from the cell and edward henry saw mr sachs give two separate dollar bills to the driver by jove he murmured i beg your pardon said mr sachs politely nothing said edward henry they walked into the hotel and passed through a long succession of corridors and vast public rooms surging with well-dressed men and women what's all this crowd for asked edward henry what crowd asked mr sachs surprised edward henry saw that he had blundered i prefer the upper floors remarked mr sachs as they were being flung upward in a gilded elevator and passing rapidly all numbers from one to fourteen the elevator made an end of carlo trent's manhood he collapsed mr sachs regarded him and then said i think i'll get an extra room for mr trent he ought to go to bed edward henry enthusiastically concurred and stay there said edward henry pale carlo trent permitted himself to be put to bed but therein he proved fictitious he was anxious about his linen mr sachs telephoned from the bedside and a laundry maid came he was anxious about his best lounge suit mr sachs telephoned and a valet came then he wanted a siphon of soda water and mr sachs telephoned and a waiter came then it was a newspaper he required mr sachs telephoned and a page came all these functionaries together with two reporters peopled mr trent's bedroom more or less simultaneously it was edward henry's bright notion to add to them a doctor a doctor whom mr sachs knew a doctor who would perceive at once that bed was the only proper place for carlo trent now said edward henry when he and mr sachs were participating in a private lunch amid the splendors and the grim silent service of the latter's suite at the stuyvesant i have fully grasped the fact that i am in new york it is one o'clock and after and as soon as ever this meal is over i have just got to find isabel joy you must understand that on this trip new york for me is merely a town where isabel joy happens to be well replied mr sachs i reckon i can put you on to that she's going to be photographed at two o'clock by rentoul smiles i happen to know because rent's a particular friend of mine a photographer you say mr sachs controlled himself 
do you mean to say you've not heard of rentoul smiles well he's called man's photographer he has never photographed a woman won't at least wouldn't but he's going to photograph isabel so you may guess that he considers isabel some woman eh? and how will that help me inquired edward henry why i'll take you up to rents mr sachs comforted him it's close by corner of thirty ninth and fifth tell me edward henry demanded with immense relief she hasn't got herself arrested yet has she no and she won't why not the police have been put wise said mr sachs put wise yes put wise i see said edward henry but he did not see he only half saw as a matter of fact said mr sachs isabel can't get away with the goods unless she fixes the police to lock her up for a few hours and she'll not succeed in that her hundred days are up in london next sunday so there'll be no time for her to be arrested and bailed out either at liverpool or fishguard and that's her only chance i've seen isabel and if you ask me my opinion she's down and out never mind said edward henry with glee i guess what you are after her for said mr seven sachs with an air of deep knowledge the deuce you do yes sir and let me tell you that dozens of em have been after her already but she wouldn't nothing would tempt her never mind edward henry smiled too when edward henry stood by the side of mr sachs in a doorway half shielded by a portiere and gazed unseen into the great studio of mr rentoul smiles he comprehended that he was indeed under powerful protection in new york at the entrance of fifth avenue he and sachs had passed through a small crowd of assorted men chiefly young whom sachs had greeted in the mass with the smiling words well boys other men were within still another went up with them in the elevator but no further they were reporters of the entire world's press to each of whom isabel joy had been specially assigned they were waiting they would wait mr rentoul smiles having been warned by telephone of the visit of his beloved friend seven sachs and his english protege had been received at smiles outer door by a clerk who knew exactly what to do with them and did it is she here mr sachs had murmured yep the clerk had negligently replied and now edward henry beheld the objective of his pilgrimage her whose personality portrait and adventures had been filling the newspapers of two hemispheres for three weeks she was not realistically like her portraits she was a little thin pale obviously nervous woman of any age from thirty-five to fifty with fair untidy hair and pale grey-blue eyes that showed the dreamer the idealist and the harsh fanatic she looked as though a moderate breeze would have overthrown her but she also looked the enlightened observer as though she would recoil before no cruelty and no suffering in pursuit of her vision the blind dreaming force behind her apparent frailty would strike terror into the heart of any man intelligent enough to understand it edward henry had an inward shudder great scott he reflected i shouldn't like to be ill and have isabel for a nurse and his mind at once flew to nelly and then to elsie april and so she's going to marry Rissell, he reflected and could scarcely believe it then he violently wrenched his mind back to the immediate objective he wondered why isabel joy should wear a bowler hat and mustard-colored jacket that resembled a sporting man's overcoat and why these garments suited her with a whip in her hand she could have sat for a jockey and yet she was a woman and very feminine and probably old enough to be elsie april's mother a disconcerting world he thought the man's photographer as he was described in copper on fifth avenue and in gold on his own doors was a big loosely articulated male who lured over the trifle isabel like a cloud over a sheep in a great field edward henry could only see his broad bending back as he posed in athletic attitudes behind the camera suddenly rentoul smiles dashed to a switch and isabel's wistful face was transformed into that of a drowned corpse into a dreadful harmony of greens and purples now said rentoul smiles in a deep voice that was like a rich unguent we'll try again we'll just play around that spot look into my eyes not at my eyes 
my dear woman into them just a little more challenge a little more that's it don't wink for the land's sake now he seized a bulb at the end of a tube and slowly squeezed squeezed it tragically and remorselessly twisting himself as if suffering in sympathy with the bulb and then in a wide sweeping gesture he flung the bulb on to the top of the camera and ejaculated ha huh. edward henry thought i would give ten pounds to see rintoul smiles photograph sir john pilgrim but the next instant the forgotten sensation of hurry was upon him once more quick quick rintoul smiles edward henry's scorching desire was to get done and leave new york now miss isabel mr smiles proceeded exasperatingly deliberate do you know i feel kind of guilty i have got a little farm out in westchester county and i'm making a little english pathway up the garden with a gate at the end i woke up this morning and began to think about the quaint english form of that gate and just how i would have it he raised a finger but i ought to have been thinking about you i ought to have been saying to myself to-day i have to photograph isabel joy and trying to understand in meditation the secrets of your personality i'm sorry now don't talk keep like that move your head round go on go on move it don't be afraid this place belongs to you it's yours whatever you do we've got people here who'll straighten up after you do you know why i've made money i've made money so that i can take you this afternoon and tell a two hundred dollar client to go to the deuce that's why i've made money put your back against the chair like an english woman that's it no don't talk i tell you now look joyful hang it look joyful no no joy isn't a contortion it's something right deep down there there the lubricant voice rolled on while rintoul smiles manipulated the camera he clasped the bulb again and again threw it dramatically away i'm through he said don't expect anything very grand miss isabel what i've been trying to do this afternoon is my interpretation of you as i've studied your personality in your speeches if i believed wholly in your cause or if i wholly disbelieved in it my work would not have been good any value that it has will be due to the sympathetic impartiality of my spiritual attitude although he menaced her with the licensed familiarity of a philosopher although lady i must say that i felt you were working against me all the time this way edward henry recalling the comparative simplicity of the london photographer at wilkins thought how profoundly they understand photography in america isabel joy rose and glanced at the watch in her bracelet then followed the direction of the male hand and vanished rintoul smiles turned instantly to the other doorway how do rent said seven sacks coming forward how do seven mr rintoul smiles winked this is my good friend alderman mackin the theatre manager from london glad to meet you sir she's not gone has she asked sachs hurriedly no my housekeeper wanted to talk to her come along and in the waiting-room full of permanent examples of the results of mr rintoul smiles spiritual attitude toward his fellow-men edward henry was presented to isabel joy the next instant the two men and the housekeeper had unobtrusively retired and he was alone with his objective in truth seven sachs was a notable organizer three she was sitting down in a cosy corner her feet on a footstool and she seemed a negligible physical quantity as he stood in front of her this was she who had worsted the entire judicial and police system of chicago who spoke pentecostal tongues who had circled the globe and held enthralled so journalists computed more than a quarter of a million of the inhabitants of marseilles athens port said candy calcutta bangkok hong kong tokyo hawaii san francisco salt lake city denver chicago and lastly new york this was she i understand we're going home on the same ship he was saying she looked up at him almost appealingly you won't see anything of me though she said why not tell me said she not answering his question what do they say of me really in england i don't mean the newspapers for instance the azure society do you know of it he nodded tell me she repeated he related the episode of the telegram at the private first performance of the orient pearl she burst out in a torrent of irrelevant protest 
the new york police have not treated me right it would have cost them nothing to arrest me and let me go but they wouldn't every man in the force you hear me every man has had strict orders to leave me unmolested it seems they resent my dealings with the police in chicago where i brought about the dismissal of four officers so they say and so i'm to be boycotted in this manner is that argument mr mackin tell me you're a man but honestly is it argument why it's just as mean and despicable as brute force i agree with you said edward henry softly do you really think it will harm the militant cause do they really think so no it will only harm me i made a mistake in tactics i trusted fool to the chivalry of the united states i might have been arrested in a dozen cities but i on purpose reserved my last two arrests for chicago and new york for the sake of the superior advertisement you see i never dreamt now it's too late i'm defeated i shall just arrive in london on the hundredth day i shall have made speeches at all the meetings but i shall be short of one arrest and the ten thousand pounds will be lost to the cause the militants here such as they are are as disgusted as i am but they scorn me and are they not right are they not right there should be no quarter for the vanquished miss joy said edward henry i have come over from england specially to see you i want to make up the loss of that ten thousand pounds as far as i can i'll explain at once i am running a poetical play of the highest merit called the orient pearl at my new theatre in piccadilly circus if you will undertake a small part in it a part of three words only i'll pay you a record salary sixty-six pounds thirteen and fourpence a word two hundred pounds a week isabel joy jumped up are you another of them then she muttered i did think from the look of you that you would know a gentlewoman when you met one did you imagine for the thousandth part of one second that i would stoop stoop exclaimed edward henry my theatre is not a music hall you want to make it into one she stopped him good day to you she said i must face those journalists again i suppose well even they i came alone in order to avoid them but it was hopeless besides is it my duty to avoid them after all it was while passing through the door that she uttered the last words where is she seven sacks inquired entering fled said edward henry everything all right quite mr rintoul smiles came in mr smiles said edward henry did you ever photograph sir john pilgrim i did on his last visit to new york here you are he pointed to his rendering of sir john what did you think of him a great actor but a mountebank sir during the remainder of the afternoon edward henry saw the whole of new york with bits of the bronx and yonkers in the distance from seven sacks's second automobile in his third automobile he went to the theatre and saw seven sacks act to a house of over two thousand dollars and lastly he attended a supper and made a speech but he insisted upon passing the remainder of the night on the lithuania in the morning isabel joy came aboard early and irrevocably disappeared into her berth and from that moment edward henry spent the whole secret force of his individuality in fervently desiring the lithuania to start at two o'clock two hours late she did start edward henry's farewells to the admirable and hospitable mr sachs were somewhat absent-minded for already his heart was in london but he had sufficient presence of mind to make certain final arrangements keep him at least a week said edward henry to seven sachs and i shall be your debtor for ever and ever he meant carlo trent still bedridden as from the receding ship he gazed in abstraction at the gigantic inconvenient word common to three languages which is the first thing seen by the arriving and the last thing seen by the departing visitor he meditated the dearness of living in the united states has certainly been exaggerated for his total expenses beyond the confines of the key amounted to one cent dispersed to buy an evening paper which had contained a brief interview with himself concerning the future of the intellectual drama in england he had told the pressman that the orient pearl would run a hundred nights save for pudding the orient girl instead of the orient pearl and two hundred nights instead of one hundred nights this interview was tolerably accurate four 
two entire interminable days of the voyage elapsed before edward henry was clever enough to encounter isabel joy the most famous and the least visible person on the ship he remembered that she had said you won't see anything of me it was easy to ascertain the number of her stateroom a double berth which she shared with nobody but it was less easy to find out whether she ever left it and if so at what time of day he could not mount guard in the long corridor and the stewardesses on the lithuania were mature experienced and uncommunicative women their sole weakness being an occasional tendency to imagine that they and not the captain were in supreme charge of the steamer however edward henry did at last achieve his desire and on the third morning at a little before six o'clock he met a muffled isabel joy on the d-deck the d-deck was wet having just been swabbed and a boat chosen for that don's boat drill ascended past them on its way from the sea level to the busy boat deck above on the other side of an iron barrier large crowds of early rising third-class passengers were standing and talking and staring at the oblong slit of sea which was the only prospect offered by the d-deck it was the first time that edward henry aboard had ever set eyes on a steerage passenger with all the conceit natural to the occupant of a costly stateroom he had unconsciously assumed that he and his like had sole possession of the ship isabel responded to his greeting in a very natural way the sharp freshness of the summer morning at sea had its tonic effect on both of them and as for edward henry he lunged and plunged at once into the subject which alone preoccupied and exasperated him she did not seem to resent it you'd have the satisfaction of helping on a thing that all your friends say ought to be helped he argued nobody but you can do it without you there'll be a frost you would make a lot of money which you could spend in helping on things of your own and surely it isn't the publicity that you're afraid of no she agreed i'm not afraid of publicity her pale gray-blue eyes shone as they regarded the secret dream that for her hung always unseen in the air and she had a strange wistful fragile feminine mien in her mannish costume well then but can't you see it's humiliating cried she as if interested in the argument it's not humiliating to do something that you can do well i know you can do it well and get a large salary for it and make the success of a big enterprise by it if you knew the play i do know the play she said we'd lots of us read it in manuscript long ago edward henry was somewhat dashed by this information well what did you think of it i think it's just splendid said she with enthusiasm and will it be any worse a play because you act a small part in it no she said shortly i expect you think it's a play that people ought to go and see don't you i do mr socrates she admitted he wondered what she could mean but continued what does it matter what it is that brings the audience into the theatre so long as they get there and have to listen she sighed it's no use discussing with you she murmured you're too simple for this world i dare say you're honest enough in fact i think you are but there are so many things that you don't understand you're evidently incapable of understanding them thanks he replied and paused to recover his self-possession but let's get right down to business now if you'll appear in this play i'll not merely give you two hundred pounds a week but i'll explain to you how to get arrested and still arrive in triumph in london before midnight on sunday she recoiled a step and raised her eyes how she demanded as with a pistol ah he said that's just it how will you promise i've thought of everything she said musingly if the last day was any day but sunday i could get arrested on landing and get bailed out and still be in london before night but on sunday no so you needn't talk like that still he said it can be done how she demanded again will you sign a contract with me if i tell you think of what your reception in london will be if you win after all just think those pale eyes gleamed for isabel joy had tasted the noisy flattery of sympathetic and of adverse crowds and her being hungered for it again the desire of it had become part of her nature she walked away her hands in the pockets of her ulster and returned what is your scheme you'll sign yes if it works i can trust you the little woman of forty or so blazed up you can refrain from insulting me by doubting my word said she sorry sorry he apologized five 
that same evening in the colossal many tabled dining saloon of the lithuania edward henry sat as usual to the left of the purser's empty chair at the purser's table where were about a dozen other men a page brought him a marconi gram he opened it and read the single word nineteen it was the amount of the previous evening's receipts at the regent in pounds he was now losing something like forty pounds a night without counting the expenses of the present excursion the band began to play as the soup was served and the ship rolled politely gently but nevertheless unmistakably accomplishing one complete roll to about sixteen bars of the music then the entire saloon was suddenly excited isabel joy had entered she was in the gallery near the orchestra at a small table alone everybody became aware of the fact in an instant and scores of necks on the lower floor were twisted to glimpse the celebrity on the upper it was remarked that she wore a magnificent evening dress one subject of conversation now occupied all the tables and it was fully occupying the purser's table when the purser generally a little late owing to the arduousness of his situation on the ship entered and sat down now the purser was a northerner from durham a delightful companion in his lighter moods but dour and with a high conception of authority and of the intelligence of dogs he would relate that when he and his wife wanted to keep a secret from their yorkshire terrier they had to spell the crucial words in talk for the dog understood their every sentence the purser's views about the cause represented by isabel joy were absolutely clear none could mistake them and the few clauses which he curtly added to the discussion rather damped the discussion and there was a pause what should you do mr purser said edward henry if she began to play any of her tricks here if she began to play any of her tricks on this ship answered the purser putting his hands on his stout knees we should know what to do of course you can arrest most decidedly i could tell you things the purser stopped for experience had taught him to be very discreet with passengers until he had voyaged with them at least ten times he concluded the captain is the representative of english law on an english ship and then in the silence created by the resting orchestra all in the saloon could hear a clear piercing woman's voice oratorical at first and then quickening ladies and gentlemen i wish to talk to you to-night on the subject of the injustice of men to women isabel joy was on her feet and leaning over the gallery rail as she proceeded a startled hush changed to uproar and in the uproar could be caught now and then a detached phrase such as for example this man governed ship possibly it was just this phrase that rousted the northerner in the purser he rose and looked toward the captain's table but the captain was not dining in the saloon that evening then he strode to the centre of the saloon beneath the renowned dome which has been so often photographed for the illustrated papers and sought to destroy isabel joy with a single marine glance having failed he called out loudly be quiet madam resume your seat isabel joy stopped for a second gave him a glance far more homicidal than his own and resumed her discourse stuart cried the purser take that woman out of the saloon the whole complement of first-class passengers was now standing up and many of them saw a plate descend from on high and grace the purser's shoulder with the celerity of a sprinter the man of authority from durham disappeared from the ground floor and was immediately seen in the gallery accounts differed afterward as to the exact order of events but it is certain that the leader of the band lost his fiddle which was broken by the lusty isabel on the purser's head it was known later that isabel though not exactly in irons was under arrest in her stateroom she really ought to have thought of that for herself if she's as smart as she thinks she is said edward henry privately six though he was on the way to high success his anxieties and solicitudes seemed to increase every hour immediately after isabel joy's arrest he became more than ever a crony of the marconi operator and began to dispatch vivid and urgent telegrams to london without counting the cost on the next day he began to receive replies it was the most interesting voyage that the marconi operator had had since the sinking of the catherine of siena in which episode his promptness through the air had certainly saved two hundred lives 
edward henry could scarcely sleep so intense was his longing for sunday night his desire to be safe in london with isabel joy nay he could not properly eat and then the doubt entered his mind whether after all he would get to london on sunday night for the lithuania was lagging she might have been doing it on purpose to ruin him every day in the auction pool on the ship's run it was the holder of the low field that pocketed the money of his fellow-men the lithuania actually descended below five hundred and forty knots in the twenty-four hours and no authoritative explanation of this behavior was ever given upon leaving new york there had been talk of reaching fishguard on saturday evening but now the prophesied moment of arrival had been put forward to noon on sunday edward henry's sole consolation was that each day on the eastward trip consisted of only twenty-three hours further he was by no means free from apprehension about the personal liberty of isabel joy isabel had exceeded the programme arranged between them it had been no part of his scheme that she should cast plates nor even break violins on the shining crown of an august purser the purser was angry and he had the captain a milder man behind him when isabel joy threatened a hunger strike if she was not immediately released the purser signified that she might proceed with her hunger strike he well knew that it would be impossible for her to expire of inanition before the arrival at fishguard the case was serious because isabel joy had created a precedent policemen and cabinet ministers had for many months been regarded as the lawful prey of militants but isabel joy was the first of the militants to damage property and heads which belonged to persons of neither of these classes and the authorities of the ship were assuredly inclined to hand isabel joy over to the police at fishguard what saved the situation for edward henry was the factor which saved most situations namely public opinion when the saloon clearly realized that isabel joy had done what she had done with the pure and innocent aim of winning a wager all that was anglo-saxon in the saloon ranged itself on the side of true sport and the matter was lifted above mere politics a subscription was inaugurated to buy a new fiddle and to pay for shattered crockery and the amount collected would have purchased after settling for the crockery a couple of dozen new fiddles the unneeded balance was given to seamen's orphanages the purser was approached the captain was implored influence was brought to bear in short the wheels that are within wheels went duly round and miss isabel joy after apologies and promises was unconditionally released but she had been arrested and then early on sunday morning the ship met a storm that had a sad influence on divine service a storm of the eminence that scares even the brass-buttoned occupants of the liner's bridges the rumor went round the ship that the captain would not call at fishguard in such weather edward henry was ready to yield up his spirit in this fearful crisis which endured two hours the captain did call at fishguard in pouring rain and men came aboard selling sunday newspapers that were full of isabel's arrest on the steamer and of the nearing triumph of her arrival in london before midnight and the newspaper correspondents also came aboard and all the way on the tender and in the sheds and in the train edward henry and isabel joy were subjected to the journalistic experiments of hardy interviewers the train arrived at paddington at nine p m isabel had won by three hours the station was a surging throng of open-mouthed people edward henry would not lose sight of his priceless charge but he sent marrier to dispatch a telegram to nelly whose wifely interest in his movements he had till then either forgotten or ignored and even now his mind was not free he saw in front of him still twenty-four hours of anguish seven the next night just before the curtain went up he stood on the stage of the regent theatre and it is a fact that he was trembling not with fear but with simple excitement through what a day he had passed there had been the rehearsal in the morning it had gone off very well save that rose euclid had behaved impossibly and that the cunningham girl the hit of the piece but ousted from her part had filled the place with just lamentations and recriminations and then had followed the appalling scene with rose euclid rose leaving the theatre for lunch had beheld the workmen removing her name from the electric sign and substituting that of isabel joy she was a woman and an artist and it would have been the same had she been a man and an artist she would not submit to this inconceivable affront she had resigned her role 
she had ripped her contract to bits and flung the bits to the breeze upon the whole edward henry had been glad he had sent for miss cunningham who was rose's understudy had given her instructions called another rehearsal for the afternoon and effected a saving of nearly half isabel joy's fantastic salary then he entered into financial negotiations with four evening papers and managed to buy at a price their contents bills for the day so that all the west end was filled with men and boys wearing like aprons posters which bore the words isabel joy to appear at the regent to-night a great and original stroke and now he gazed through the peephole of the curtain upon a crammed and half delirious auditorium the assistant stage manager ordered him off the curtain went up on the drama and hexameters he waited in the wings and spoke soothingly to isabel joy who looking juvenile in the airy costume of the messenger stood fluttering agog for her cue he heard the thunderous crashing roar that met her entrance he did not hear her line he walked forth to the glazed balcony at the front of the house where in the interax dandies smoked cigarettes baptized with girlish names he could see piccadilly circus and he saw piccadilly circus thronged with a multitude of loafers who were happy in the mere spectacle of isabel joy's name glowing on an electric sign he went back at last to the managerial room marier was there hero worshipping got the figures yet he asked marier beamed two hundred and sixty pounds as long as it keeps up it means a profit of getting on for two hundred a night but dash it man the house only holds two hundred and thirty but my good sir said marier they're paying ten shillings apiece to stand up in the dress circle edward henry dropped into a chair at the desk a telegram was lying there addressed to himself what's this he demanded just cam he opened it and read i absolutely forbid this monstrous outrage on a work of art trent bit late in the day isn't it said edward henry showing the telegram to marier besides marier observed he'll come round when he knows what his royalties are well said edward henry i'm going to bed and he gave a devastating yawn eight one afternoon edward henry sat in the king of all the easy chairs in the drawing-room of his house in trafalgar road bursley although the month was september and the weather warm even for september a swan's down quilt lay spread upon his knees his face was pale his hands were paler but his eye was clear and his visage enlightened his beard had grown to nearly its original dimensions on a chair by his side were a number of letters to which he had just dictated answers at a neighboring table a young clerk was using a typewriter stretched at full length on the sofa was robert mackin engaged in the perusal of the second edition of that day's signal of late robert having exhausted nearly all available books had been cultivating during his holidays an interest in journalism and he would give great accounts in the nursery of events happening in each day's instalment of the signal's sensational serial his heels kicked idly one against the other a powerful voice resounded in the lobby and dr sterling entered the room with nelly well doc edward henry greeted him so you're in full blast again observed the doctor using a metaphor invented by the population of a district where the roar of furnaces wakens the night no edward henry protested as an invalid always will i'm only just keeping an eye on one or two pressing things of course he's in full blast said nelly with calm conviction what's this i hear about ye ganging away to the seaside saturday asked the doctor well can't i said edward henry ye can said the doctor let's have a look at ye man what was it you said i've had edward henry questioned colonitis yes that's the word i thought i couldn't have got it wrong well you should have seen my mother's face when i told her what you called it she said he may call it that if he's a mind to but we had another name for it in my time you should have heard her sniff look here doc do you know you've had me down now for pretty near three months nay said sterling it's your own obstinacy that's had ye down man if ye'd listened to your blunden doctor at first mayhap ye wouldn't have had to travel from euston in an invalid's carriage if ye hadn't had the misfortune to be born an obstinate simpleton ye'd ha been up and about six weeks back but there's no doing anything with you geniuses 
it's all nerves with you and your like nerves exclaimed edward henry pretending to scorn but he was delighted at the diagnosis nerves repeated the doctor firmly ye go gadding off to america ye get yeself mixed up in theatres how's the theatre i see your famous plays coming to an end next week and what if it is said edward henry jealous for reputations including his own it will have run for a hundred and one nights and right through august too no modern poetry play ever did run as long in london and no other ever will i've given the intellectual theatre the biggest ad it ever had and i've made money on it i should have made more if i'd ended the run a fortnight ago but i was determined to pass the hundredth night and i shall do and what are ye forgiving next i'm not forgiving anything next doc i've let the regent for five years at seven thousand five hundred pounds a year to a musical comedy syndicate since you're so curious and when i've paid the ground rent and taxes and repairs and something toward a sinking fund and six per cent on my capital i shall have not far off two thousand pounds a year clear annual profit you may say what you like but that's what i call business it was a remarkable fact that while giving undemanded information to dr sterling edward henry was in reality defending himself against the accusations of his wife accusations which by the way she had never uttered but which he thought he read sometimes in her face he might of course have told his wife these agreeable details directly and in private but he was a husband and like many husbands apt to be indirect nelly said not a word then you're giving up london the doctor rose to depart i am said edward henry almost blushing why well the genius answered those theatrical things are altogether too exciting and risky and they're such queer people great scott i've come out on the right side as it happens but well i'm not as young as i was i've done with london the five towns are good enough for me nelly unable to restrain a note of triumph indiscreetly remarked with just the air of superior sagacity that in a wife drives husbands to fury and to foolishness i should think so indeed edward henry leaped from his chair and the swan's down quilt swathed his slippered feet nell he exploded clenching his hand if you say that once more in that tone once more mind i'll go and take a flat in london to-morrow the doctor crackled with laughter nelly smiled even robert who had completely ignored the doctor's entrance glanced round with creased brows sit down dearest nelly quietly enjoined the invalid but he would not sit down and to show his independence he helped his wife to escort sterling into the lobby robert now alone with the ignored young clerk tapping at the table turned toward him and in his deliberate judicial disdainful childish voice said to him isn't father a funny man end of isabel end of the old adam by arnold bennett